Uh, wow, what a, what a film of weirdos. Uh, tell us about the music. Is that, was it, was, did the music start come before the film, or uh, did it come after? Uh, well, some of the music was in the screenplay. Uh, when you travel back in time for that, I think I was about the same age as Kit. I was about 15 or 16 in, in the summer of 76. Uh, so some of the songs uh, were in the script, and, uh, and we had a lot of fun just kind of trolling through the, uh, the archives and, and uh, putting a few others in. Uh, that was a Canton treat. <laughs> And what was it like? Is that your first time you've shot in Nova Scotia? You shot a film uh, film there? No, I've shot uh, some other things there. I've shot a TV show and this strange, kind of crazy miniseries about killer waves attacking America, um, which was pretty fun to shoot there. But this is, uh, yeah, the first time in a while. Daniel McIver, who's the writer, who's the playwright, he's from Sydney, Nova Scotia, so uh, this is kind of. Uh, Partly Daniel channeling his uh, summer of being 15. Excellent. And you want to tell, tell us something about the, okay. the, the experience. <laughs> uh, well, we, we were shooting about this time last year, uh, uh, just the sort of tail end of summertime in Nova Scotia. It was a small little band of uh, uh, filmmakers. Um, about 15 of us kind of going up and down the land and uh, um, I was the visitor I was the guy from Ontario and uh, pretty much everybody else was from there except a couple actors that came in Molly Parker who uh, is from here is from here the wonderful Molly Parker who played Laura the mother in the film and um, I think Steve McCaddy came out and uh, yeah it was just one of those wonderful Pleasant summertime shoots. Now, one of your actors is here, is that right? Uh, Julia, I don't know if Julia's here or not. Julia Sarah Stone, who plays uh, Alice. Well, Julia uh, is also from Vancouver, and uh, she has become a very accomplished actress at the young age of 18. She's done a few other really terrific things, so we felt very, very lucky to have Julia. Uh, she was with great. Us. Yeah, she was. She was. She was excellent, I'm a big, big fan. I met Julia because of Molly's, uh, Molly's connection. Um, uh, so yeah, that was, I don't know what else I can tell you about. Please. Some questions here, yes. Why, why did you go with the black white? Well, uh, red was very expensive, and uh, <laughs> green was a very difficult negotiation. Uh, blue was available, but uh, sort of, attached to many other projects, unfortunately, so we went with our old friends black and white. No, we, we uh, it was, you know, we kind of, it was a kind of a late decision, I think, in the production. Daniel McIver and I were talking one night, and uh, I don't know how it, I don't know where it sprung from, but the idea of, you know, that we were time traveling and music helped get us there, and we thought, well, maybe black and white, because when you see black and white, it feels a bit like a memory. It feels like not now, it feels then. And, uh, you know, we were doing our best to take people back to that time. And we had a very, you know, very minimal budget for uh, things on the screen, like cars and clothes and things. We had just enough to get a couple of cars, or a, a couple of TVs, and a fridge, I think. So everything else, you know, that helped take us back to that time, uh, we thought was important. So that's why. We chose black and white. And I'm not sure if this has ever been tested, but do you think that the suspension of disbelief works better in black and white? Um, uh, could be, you know. Um, there was a, a famous uh, fa famous film director, Mike Nichols, who's known for The Graduate and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, and he loved shooting in black and white. And he had a, a quote where he was asked about why he loved it so much, and he I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something, to paraphrase him, it was something about, well, when you shoot in color, it's about real life. It's about trying to channel real life, and black and white is just outside of real life, looking at it. So that sort of comes close to what you were talking about. Please.
No, that was a later edition. That was a, and yeah. But we love the Poppy family. <laughs> oh, come on. That's amazing. Round of applause for your And round of applause. Some of the best sweet sounds this ever came out of this country. So yeah, you must be very proud. Yeah, so, my gosh. And the applause. Please. How did Andy Warhol's ghost uh, work its way into the script? Um, well, it's funny. Uh, scripts go through uh, evolutions, as probably people, there are probably filmmakers here that understand that notion. And so when the first draft came in, Daniel's a very snappy writer. There was a little reference to, you know, uh, the book that he puts in his suitcase. And I'm always looking for a sort of a... I don't know what, but I'm always looking for a little gimmick or a little fun or a little extra twist. And I was kind of whining to Daniel one day. I said, well, you know, this is, you know, it's very realistic and it's very, is there anything we can do to kind of just, I don't know, just get a little kooky somehow? I don't know what it would be. And we talked a bit and I, him or I riffed off of like, well, maybe Andy Warhol shows up now and again. And, uh... I think it was me, actually, I said that to Daniel, and he kind of looked at me like, I don't want to make changes in the script. It's perfect as it is. I said, well, just, you know, you know, uh, he's like a kind of a ghost, or he's a kind of a spirit animal. That's how I tried to explain it to him. And so he, he kind of was very patient with me. And then the next day, he, he phoned me up. and said, it works. It's great. I love it. I got it in five times. And uh, I didn't know what he'd written. And then uh, I was... You know, I thought, well, oh, that's a pretty uh, fun idea. And then we were lucky to find uh, this terrific actor. There's Julia. Let's hear it. Let's give her a nice Vancouver welcome. I was directed to the wrong theater. <laughs> that's okay. We were just talking about Andy. We were waiting for the real stuff to come. So, uh... Uh, well, I've known Daniel for quite some time. One of my first jobs in the film or in the entertainment business was a at a one line uh, in, in a play of his. I was a cab driver, and I said, "Anybody need a cab?" Uh, so that was in one of Daniel's productions, and that's how I met him. And we've been kind of we worked on a bunch of stuff together. So uh, this was um, an idea that he brought to me, and he told me that story in a couple sentences. I, I thought it was great and having great trust in Daniel. I'm a big fan of his, uh, he's a playwright for people who don't know him and a performer and he does these remarkable uh, sort of one man shows and you know other uh, plays, more sort of traditional structures of plays. Uh, and he's just a wonderful, creative, funny, uh, very productive fellow. So I feel really lucky to have him in the band. Uh, Julia, are you actually a weirdo, or do you just play one on film? I think we're all weirdos. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to you have to be a certain amount of um, odd or eccentric to be in this industry and to, to do any form of art, I think. But, um, yeah, I think there's definitely elements of, of Kit and Alice in all of us. What was the biggest surprise for you on the set? Um, I would say the biggest shock factor for me was uh, just walking on set and, and being transported to a totally different era. Um, it was... How old were you in 1976? <laughs> <laughs> Negative something. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it was it was amazing because I, I wasn't even alive, so to say that I, I was actually felt like I was in the time is, is a, a big thing, and it's really a testament to how amazing the teams on set decoration and wardrobe were. Excellent. I saw another hand up there. How did Kathy Jones come to join the band? Uh, well, no, you know, she's great. We all felt a little guilty making her a grandmother. Uh, <laughs> but she was so sport about it. And uh, she, again, is part of that gang, like with uh, Daniel McIver, who's from uh, Sydney, Alan Hocko, and they've worked together before. 
uh, yeah, she's just a dream. She was so funny and a uh, lovely, lovely uh, performer. Back there, please. Well, if you read closely, as you have a very good eye, the the, uh, the 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 actual credit I think reads a uh, uh, torso of the American man, Jonathan Torrance. So there's a short scene in the diner where you see Kit and Alice and they're eating some fries, and the waitress is asking them some questions. And at the very end of the scene, if you look be behind uh, Alice, you'll see a figure enter the restaurant, just the torso. Well, there was a whole other part of the scene <clears throat> that Jonathan did a very, very good job in. But sometimes in editing, the movie tells you it might be a really great scene, but we have to move on. We have to, we got, we got to get to Sydney. So I felt so guilty about having to cut him out. But I realized, no, there's part of Jonathan still in the film, his torso. <laughs> So I wrote him a letter uh, before, because sometimes you for, not forget, but you know, the people come with their families and their grandma and their nieces, and they're like, I'm in this movie, and they just don't appear, and it's horribly embarrassing for the poor actor. So I thought, in case he's making plans, I should let him know. So I wrote him a very nice letter, and I told him what had happened. A, amazed that somebody took the time to tell him and done it in such a classy way, and then he started riffing in his Jonathan way, talking about the new awards called the Torsis or something, like the Torsis, <laughs> that were going to happen. Anyway, so, thank you for asking that question. Yes, please. Did the same thing happen to Stephen Bacchetti, or did you really hire him just to drive to keep this one shot in a drive? Well, it's sort of impressive if you think it was just like, hey, being a shot. But no, it's a sort of similar thing. There was just this weird thing, and we... We wrestled with this in the editing room. It was, um, you know, you, you cut it together as the script is, and then there's just a bit in the middle where it just seems like, okay, we gotta get going. So I'm happy that Steve makes his remarkable two-shot, one-shot cameo. I still have to talk to Steve in person. <laughs> but he'll be fine. I don't actually remember how much time there was. Do you remember? It wasn't a lot of time. No, there wasn't. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I did a lot of research, um, especially doing something from the 70s. I, I learned a lot about what it was like socially and culturally. And um, yeah, it was, it was a, lot of, uh, a lot of character stuff. Um, yeah, but as an actor, like you, you do all this preparation and, and then you get there and it just needs, you just gotta forget about it. Um, and so most of, most of it is just what arises authentically in the moment. And I think that's part, of, that's part of what makes this film so great is that it's all so genuine and authentic. And, and part of that is Daniel McIver's writing is it felt like improv when we were saying the lines, which is really, really special. I just want to say you did a great job first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for the creators. <laughs> and please don't forget to mark your ballots on the way out. And I'm going to recommend somewhere at the four or five range. <laughs> Cheers. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.